Hi guys, welcome to a video and in today's video we're just going to be looking at lesbian cinema and sapphic themes in cinema from the early 20th century, more specifically between the years 1902 to 1933. And I'll tell you right now, this is a period of time which is particularly rich in lesbian history and tea. Now, there were a lot of socio-political and economic factors that influenced the kind of cinema that was being produced in the early 20th century. But in relation to this video topic, factors such as the liberalisation of female sexuality, feminist advancements and changing perceptions of gender roles and expectations all collectively influenced the depiction of female characters and the way that they related to each other on screen throughout this period. Alongside that, in the early 20th century, both lesbianism and gender nonconformity in women were very much seen as controversial and as a spectacle. And both independent filmmakers and studios in this period soon realised that productions containing controversial themes or shocking situations often resulted in more ticket sales. Not much has changed, huh? Therefore, this financial gain was not only a contributing factor to the presence of on-screen lesbianism or female gender non-conforming representation in the early 20th century, but also why early attempts to implement guidelines that discouraged or censored the portrayal of homosexuality on screen were largely ignored. Money talks. Baby. Depictions of lesbianism or female same-sex attraction became most overt in the pre-code era, and this is one of many factors that contributed to the eventual enforcement of the Hayes Code. Since homosexuality was very much perceived as immoral in that period and provoked a lot of outrage amongst religious groups, the same groups who were pretty much responsible for the Hayes Code. If you didn't know, the Hayes Code, which is the enforcement formal name for the Motion Picture Production Code was a set of industry guidelines for the self-censorship of content that was applied to most motion pictures released by major studios in the United States from 1934 to 1968, and it forbid the mention or portrayal of homosexuality. But it should also be noted here that the code was actually first adopted by the Motion Picture Producers and Distributors of America, the Trade Association for for the motion picture industry in 1930, but because it wasn't properly enforced until 1934, there's a short time frame in the early 1930s, also known as the pre-code era, where American cinema was able to portray same-sex intimacy and themes despite its adoption. If you're interested in the Hayes Code and its impact on on-screen lesbian representation, I do have a whole video about it. It actually serves as a part two to this video. It's like a Muppets movie sequel. As a disclaimer, with the exception of Mation in Uniform, whilst a lot of the cinema that we're going to be looking at in this video contains visuals of same-sex intimacy or lesbian themes, they are not what you would necessarily consider lesbian films by today's standards. Nonetheless, all of the productions that we are going to be looking at in this video are relevant not only to the history of on-screen lesbian representation, but to general lesbian history as well. Now, to start with, since we're taking it right back to the very beginnings of lesbian cinema, it's worth mentioning here that in the 19th century, a man named Edward Mybridge, who is most known for the advancement of both technical and aesthetic applications of the photography medium, which ultimately led to the development of cinema, captured the first ever kiss on film ever, and it was between two women. He's like a 19th century Eileen Shaken. The images of the two unclothed women kissing were created between 1872 and 1885, using a bank of still cameras firing in sequence. And the nature of this kiss may look somewhat distasteful, but Mybridge did a lot of study around movement and anatomy to help serve his studies on human and animal movement. So the nature of this shoot was at least somewhat in the interests of art and science. Yeah, I filmed those two naked women kissing for a, a, a science. 
And it should be noted that he wasn't allowed to photograph men and women together in the same way because of the strict Victorian taboos around expressions of sexuality at the time. In the 19th century, women were thought of as having little to no sexual desire, and female homosexuality was not perceived or outlawed in the same way that male homosexuality was. Or really acknowledged at all. Really. So a depiction of two women kissing at that time was nowhere near as scandalous as a man and a woman kissing in that way or two men kissing in that way. Which is why Mybridge was able to capture it on film and not be arrested for it. He was arrested for killing a man, but that's that's for another another time. Now, this is not to say that there were no salacious motivations involved in this shoot whatsoever. Just that there are other factors to take into consideration about the kiss within the context of the time that it was captured. And this kiss is relevant to on-screen lesbian history because it's the very first depiction of a kiss between two women to be captured on film ever. And in fact, technically the first kiss to be captured between any two people on film ever, which makes it especially noteworthy. The advancement of photographic technology between the late 19th century and early 20th century resulted in the creation of cinema and the rise of the film industry. And it's within this period that sapphic visuals and themes first began to appear on screen. The first piece of cinema to contain sapphic themes in the early 20th century is the 1902 French film Midwife to the Upper Class, directed by Alice Guy Blanc and starring Alice Guy Blanche and Yvonne Sarand. Midwife to the Upper Class is about a midwife who helps a rich couple pick out a baby from her cabbage patch. Why don't they make films like this anymore? Somebody needs to do a modern day lesbian remake of this film. I for one would watch the f out of a film about a lesbian couple picking a baby out of a cabbage patch to adopt. I just want to give a disclaimer here that this film contains racist content. There's a part of the film where the couple are offered a black baby instead of a white one and they react in a horrified manner. I just wanted to mention it as a warning to those who haven't seen this film and are thinking of watching it. It is something to be aware of. The sapphic elements in Midwife to the Upper Class are that the female director, Alice Guy Blanche, also plays the male half of the married couple, which inadvertently certainly provides the film with some rather overt sapphic visuals. And from these visuals, a midwife to the upper class could just as easily be perceived as being about a feminine butch lesbian couple adopting a baby as it could a heterosexual one, unwittingly providing a rather unique source of on-screen lesbian representation. The film is also unique in that it has a woman play the role of a man, something which was unprecedented in cinema at that time. And its groundbreaking depiction of female gender nonconformity on screen is another of the film's attributes which make it a notable source of cinema containing sapphic themes from this time. Interestingly, not only was Alice Guy Blanche the first female director ever, she was generally acknowledged to be the first ever director to film a narrative story too. So she's a significant figure in the history of female filmmaking. It's just a shame about the racism. The next film is the 1914 American production of Florida Enchantment. Directed by Sidney Drew and starring Edith Story, a Florida Enchantment is about a young woman who discovers a seed that can make women act like men and men act like women. She decides to take one, then slips one to her maid and another to her fiancé, which results in a lot of fun and chaos. Similar to Midwife to the Upper Class, I want to give a disclaimer that this film also contains racist content, this time in the form of blackface so again, it's something to be aware of if you haven't seen the film and are planning on watching it. A Florida Enchantment is believed to have the first documented appearance of bisexual characters in an American movie, and whilst the narrative is heteronormative due to the plot involving sex swapping and sexual reorientation, the film is rich in sapphic visuals depicting intimacy and flirtations between women. The film is also generally very outlandish 
outlandish and bold for the time in which it was created due to its gender transgressions and sexual subversions, which unintentionally or intentionally provided a source of visibility for both gay men and lesbians, as well as gender non-conforming people. And all of these factors earned the film a number of disgruntled reviews upon its release. Interestingly, A Florida Enchantment was co-written by Marguerite Birch, an innovator in female filmmaking whose 1917 text, How to Write for Moving Pictures, a manual of instruction and information, reflected and influenced the screenwriters of the early 20th century. And another interesting fact about this film, which I literally yelled out loud about upon first reading, is that after Lillian Travers, who is the female protagonist in A Florida Enchantment, changes her sex, she adopts the name Lawrence Talbot, a name which 27 years later would be used for the title character of the 1941 film The Wolfman, which I thought was such a cool connection. The next film is the 1922 American production Manslaughter, directed by Cecil B. DeMille and starring Latrice Joy and Lois Wilson. Manslaughter is about a rich society girl who causes the death of a policeman, is prosecuted by her fiancé and is then sent to prison. Later she reforms her partying and wild ways, but her ex-fiancé becomes a wasted alcoholic. The sapphic element in Manslaughter is that it features an explicit lesbian kiss, and this kiss is significant because unlike Midwife to the Upper Class and A Florida Enchantment, it's not excused or distorted within the context of heteronormativity, and it's also a lot more explicit than the previous same-sex kisses shown in cinema. Alongside this in the scene, the same-sex kiss is portrayed in the same hedonistic light as the heterosexual kisses, rather than it being singled out as a satanic or immoral act in contrast, which makes it an especially notable moment in cinema from this period. The next film is the 1929 German production Pandora's Box, directed by Georg Wilhelm Pabst and starring Louise Brooks and Alice Roberts. Pandora's Box follows a femme fatale as her charms bring ruin to her numerous admirers and eventually to herself. The Suffolk elements in this film are, first and foremost, its lesbian character, the Countess Gershwitz, who is unique in the sense that she's a lesbian character, who doesn't necessarily meet a tragic ending due to her homosexuality, and is framed as protective rather than predatory. On top of this, the Countess Gershwitz is considered to be the first overtly lesbian character to be depicted in a film. There's also a very suggestive dance between the Countess and the character of Lulu, where it's implied that there's more going on between the two of them. And whilst the dance wasn't considered scandalous in all countries, it was enough to prompt the UK and some states in the USA to censor parts of the film or excise the character of Gershwitz from the film altogether. Interestingly, there are a lot of rumours that Louise Brooks herself was a lesbian. However, whilst in later years she did acknowledge that she had engaged in some lesbian activity, including a one-night affair with Greta Garbo, she still identified as straight. Make of that what you will. The next film is the 1929 American production The Wild Party, directed by Dorothy Arzner and starring Clara Bow and Marceline Day. This film follows a group of wild girls at college who pay more attention to parties than to their classes. But when one party girl, Stella Ames, goes too far at a local bar and gets in trouble, her professor has to rescue her and gossip linking the two of them then escalates. The sapphic elements in The Wild Party mainly revolve around the heavy lesbian subtext and suggestive visuals threaded throughout it, such as the longing looks, intimate embraces, and intense homoeroticism among the girls. The film is also unique for the fact that its main focus is on women, most of whom are portrayed as independent, carefree, and assertive, and whose friendships are progressively framed in a positive light rather than a competitive one. Interestingly, the director of 
of the Wild Party, Dorothy Arzner was an open lesbian, and her career in feature films spanned from the silent era of the late 1920s into the early 1940s, with the Wild Party being her first real success. Arzner was also the first woman to join the Directors Guild of America, and if that wasn't enough, she even rigged a microphone to a fishing rod during the Wild Party to create the first ever boom mic. She's like if Eileen Shaken and Thomas Edison merged together to form a new person, and that person was a lesbian. I don't know what I'm saying. The next film is the 1930 American production Morocco. Directed by Joseph von Sternberg and starring Marlene Dietrich, Morocco is about a cabaret singer and a legionnaire who fall in love. But their relationship is complicated by the results of his womanising and the appearance of a rich man who wants her for himself. The sapphic element in this film revolves around the iconic scene of a gender non-conforming Marlene Dietrich performing in a top hat and kissing another woman. And this kiss is very suggestive, being both playful yet daring at the same time. Whilst it may not seem like much in the modern day, this kind of same-sex affection went directly against the censorship that the Hays Code was pushing for at this time. And interestingly, in the film, Dietrich's character, Amy Jolly, is actually applauded for the kiss as opposed to shamed or demonised for it. Of course, this is largely because it's recognised as part of an act, and heteronormativity is soon restored when she throws the flower to her male love interest Tom at the end of the scene. But even still, this kiss is incredibly iconic and is arguably what Morocco is most remembered for. Interestingly, Marlene Dietrich was also openly bisexual, and despite being married with a daughter, she had numerous affairs with both men and women, sometimes referring to her female lovers as her sewing circle. I must get back into crafts. The next film is the 1931 production Mation in Uniform, directed by Leontine Sagan and starring Hertha Thieler and Dorothea Week. Mation in Uniform is about a young, sensitive girl who is sent to an all-girls boarding school and develops a romantic attachment to one of her teachers. In terms of lesbian cinema, Mation in Uniform is perhaps the most important production from the early 20th century, because its narrative explicitly centres around lesbianism and shows affection between two women within that context, earning it recognition as both the first ever lesbian film and as a landmark in cinema in general. Mation in Uniform is also noteworthy for challenging prejudices about homosexuality and for providing a sympathetic portrayal of same-sex attraction by highlighting how oppressive structures are damaging to the individual and vilifying the system instead of the person, something that was both groundbreaking and radical at the time. Interestingly, as a result of the film's explicit lesbian content, the Nazi regime attempted to burn all existing copies of it, but thankfully they were unable to as prints had already been distributed around the world by the time they came into power. And the film was almost banned in the US, but managed to have a limited release between 1932 and 1933 because Eleanor Roosevelt, the first lady of the United States at the time, spoke so highly of it. It was however still heavily censored in showings until the 1970s, when the full uncensored version was made possible. Public. And finally, we have the 1933 production Queen Christina, directed by Ruben Mamouyan and starring Greta Garbo and Elizabeth Young. The film is about Queen Christina of Sweden, who, as she falls in love with the Roman Catholic Spanish ambassador, must choose between the throne or him. Greta Garbo was a bisexual Swedish American actress who, because of her popularity at the time, was given a significant amount of creative control over the film she starred in, including Queen Christina. And due to Garbo's influence, the guidelines that the Hays Code laid 
out at the time, which forbid any mention or portrayal of homosexuality, were observably ignored for the film, and instead Queen Christina includes some rather rich and overt sapphic elements. Firstly, the film introduces Christina as a king instead of a queen, which immediately characterises her as someone who challenges the norm, and she further subverts gender stereotypes by only being seen in clothing that was traditionally worn by men at the time. In real life, Queen Christina was documented as dressing in breeches and other clothing traditionally worn by men in Sweden, and it's possible that this was allowed in the film for the sake of historical accuracy, as quote-end-quote cross-dressing was still illegal and frowned upon throughout the United States during this time, which gives you an idea of how radical a production Queen Christina was. Christina also has three romantic partners throughout the film, two men and one woman. And although her female lover, Ebba, is not imperative to the plot, her presence is still significant because the two share a kiss within a romantic context, which, similar to Mation in Uniform, was radical to see on screen at the time. And this would also be the last romantic kiss between two women on screen before the Hayes Code came into full force. There's strong historical evidence to suggest that the ambassador romance in Queen Christina is fictional and that in real life, she was reluctant to marry because she was a lesbian. It's well documented that the real Queen Christina had an attraction to women and loved them romantically. One prominent example being her relationship with her lady-in-waiting, Ebba Spara. The two women frequently slept in the same bed and Christina is recorded as having made suggestive comments about Ebba and their relationship. On top of that, Queen Christina also allegedly had other female lovers too. Get it, girl! So alongside portraying a same-sex relationship and gender nonconformity, Queen Christina reflects a real piece of lesbian history as well. Interestingly, unlike in the film Morocco, where Amy Jolly runs after her male love interest in the end, Queen Christina goes off to face a new world on her own after Antonio dies in her arms. Which, for a female character to walk away by herself at the end of a film instead of with a man, was an incredibly progressive and unique concept for the time, and yet another reason why Queen Christina stands out against so many other productions from the early 20th century. So, as you can see, these productions are all significant in various ways, not only in relation to the history of on-screen lesbianism, but to general lesbian history as well. And I think one of the most interesting observations about early 20th century sapphic cinema is the female influence and the presence of female directors working on a lot of these productions, as well as the multifaceted and progressive way that female characters were depicted on screen during this period too. Something that rapidly diminished with the enforcement of the Hayes Code and in lesbian cinema in general right up until the 1980s. Due to the film industry becoming increasingly male-dominated and patriarchal, what's also interesting is how the more relaxed censorship in the early 20th century reveals how lesbianism and same-sex intimacy was an organic part of human experience, reflected in the art being produced at the time. And this was despite how homophobic the socio-political climate was back then, making these productions especially remarkable. The existence of these films and the acknowledgement of the existence of these films is also important given how often history is straightwashed with homosexuality being completely erased. A lot of people often think back on periods such as the early 20th century and project this idolised illusion of heteronormativity onto it, when in reality lesbians and bisexual women very much existed in this period. And had relationships with each other as they have done all throughout history, which the films that we've looked at in this video very much highlight. And all of this makes the sapphic cinema produced in the early 20th century incredibly significant and interesting to look back on. Okay guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know your thoughts on early 20th century sapphic cinema down in the comments section below. Maybe leave me the film projector emoji as well if you're feeling it. 
And what is it? Ignorance is bliss. <laughs> Don't forget to subscribe for instant disappointment and I'll see you guys soon. Bye.